All right, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. This is our last uh, session for the day. Please take your seats. This session here is about uh, minority reports covering ethnic minorities in Asia. So please do uh, take your seat. Take your seats. Okay. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, AAJ member Joanna Chu, uh, prolific writer here in Hong Kong and uh, very much keyed into the uh, uh, minority journalism scene, minority scene here in Hong Kong. So I'll let Joanna take it away and introduce her panelists. By the way, we are missing one person who's stuck in, in, in a taxi, uh, Chris Buckley, he's on his way. So we'll continue first. At this panel, we have free journalists and free representatives from NGOs in conversation about how best media can cover ethnic minority issues. So I have on my left, Annie Lestari. Annie has been a domestic worker in Hong Kong since 1999 from Indonesia, and she is among many different hats she has, spokesperson for the Asian Migrant Coordinating Body, and she's been at the forefront of migrant workers' advocacy for over a decade. And we have Ho Ling Yip. She is the acting executive director of Hong Kong Unison, and an NGO that has been serving ethnic minority residents in Hong Kong and fighting for their rights. And we have Gabrielle Paluch. <laughs> She's a freelance journalist based in Myanmar. Um, doing a lot of work for Voice of America and a lot of other publications um, and covering the ethnic minorities in Southeast Asia very in depth. And we have Aideen here. She kind of is on both sides of the fences. She came into NGO work at the Hong Kong Justice Center, formerly known as the Refugee Advice Center, um, from being a journalist in Scotland. So I'll ask um, our journalists panelists right now to start with um, introducing yourself, your work, and to bring up one interesting experience you've had covering ethnic minorities, what you found surprising, what you learned from it. Let's start with Gabriel because Chris is on his way. Hello? Is this working? Oh, hi. Um, so I'm Gabrielle Paluch, and we have a lot of, or the biggest ethnic minority story that we've been covering in Myanmar this year has been the Rohingya story. And a lot of, a lo unfortunately, a lot of that story is reporting on violence. So there have been a lot of incidences where, or incidents where there have been um, massacres, essentially, that are being denied by the government. And the biggest challenge to covering those incidents is that we just don't get access, and the government denies us access to actually get on the ground and figure out what the facts are. Um, and there have been a couple uh, a couple stories in the past two, two years where um, we have been able to get access, and once we do get access and we do figure out what's going on frequently, we find that there's just a tragic um, incident of the authorities failing in protecting this ethnic group from violence that's being wreaked on on them by their neighbors, by their Buddhist neighbors. So there'll, there'll be a group of Muslims who are a member of this ethnic group, the Rohingya, and the government denies their existence or denies that they are Rohingya. And Buddhists will normally, because of a rumor, like there'll be a rumor that there was a rape or that someone insulted a Buddhist flag or something to that effect, and the result will be arson and murder, and typically what we've seen is that the police have done nothing to prevent Buddhist mobs from attacking um, es essentially helpless Muslim communities. There was an incident where a 98-year-old paraplegic woman was hacked to death by a Buddhist mob. So she was clearly <laughs> incapable of threatening anyone because she was paraplegic. Um, but yeah, I guess one of the biggest challenges that we've, that we've had this past year is just trying to figure out what's really happening because it's, so, it's such a sensitive issue for the government and they try to cover it up and they deny that these massacres are happening. And then not only do they deny that these things are happening, they deny the existence of the people <laughs> that, or at least deny them their identity. 
and the other part of it, so there's been a lot of those massacres and that kind of stuff that we've been covering, and then there's been a lot of, um, a lot of them fleeing by boat, which will probably be the story that most of you have heard. Um, and most recently, during the census, and I think, yeah, oh yeah. So that, that was when there was a fire in a mosque, but it, apparently it was just an accident and 14 young boys died, 14 Muslim boys died, and it, it, um, you know, it, ca it caused a lot of problems in the community because there were so many accusations and it's such a tense situation. But um, during, most recently during the census, it was the first census in 30 years, and uh, essentially because of the census, the Buddhists in Rakhine State didn't want the Rohingya or the Muslims to be counted during the census because they don't exist. So <laughs> they don't want them to be counted. So uh, a bunch of Buddhists sort of got together and mobbed and a 13-year-old girl was killed um, by accident. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I suppose the, the biggest issue that we're facing is that the government tries to cover up and deny and denies us as journalists access journalists denies us access. And yeah, that's kind of the biggest issue we face. Mm -hmm. And how about Aideen? Because Aideen, um, she's working for Hong Kong Justice Center, which primarily serves, so far, the majority of your clientele is refugees, asylum seekers, protection seekers. So what's been one big story recently, and how did you handle the media request, and why do you think it did get more media coverage? Um, as Joanna mentioned, I work for Justice Centre Hong Kong. Um, we're a service and an advocacy organisation and we primarily work with refugees, but we also work on um, issues around human trafficking. Um, I came to work into NGO work um, from a print journalist background. Um, and why I was initially attracted to work in this area was I was working as a print journalist in Scotland. Um, and was covering a lot of these issues for um, uh, a number of publications. Um, a newspaper called The Sunday Herald, and I also freelanced for a publication called The Big Issue magazine, which was a campaigning magazine and, and covered quite a lot of these issues. And I was always, um, I, I tried very hard to cover these issues and, and convince editors to, to do them, but. For me, in, in reporting, the biggest barrier that, um, that I faced was trying to, to implement or incorporate refugee voices into the stories I was doing. Um, and I started to do some work with a project called um, the Asylum Positive Images Network. Uh, and they actually asked me to come and work with them, so I, I, I did it. Um, and I tried to, my, my job, um, I worked for Scottish Refugee Council, and my job was to try and work with refugees to support them to speak to the media and tell their stories. Um, and one of the biggest barriers, some of journalists here may have covered these stories themselves, and, and one of the biggest barriers that refugees face is, is fear, obviously fear of many things. Fear of talking to the media itself, um, because where they come from, the media may, may have been complicit with the government who uh, was involved in their persecution. There's a great fear that speaking to the media may uh, compromise their claim, that maybe something might be misreported and, and that could um, contest what their, their story was. Um, fear for their family and their country of origin with the digital age and internet. Um, your story travels far and there could be repercussions for your family. Um, great fear for themselves, with their, they may have to reveal or tell very traumatic, traumatic events. Um, and personal stories, so there's very fear, they're, they're very fearful to do that. Um, now I'm working on the other side of the fence uh, with Justice Centre Hong Kong, um, and in Hong Kong, um, working on these issues, trying to support refugees to speak to the media, there is all that fear, but it's further compounded, I find, in Hong Kong, in that there's a real sense from authorities that if you speak to the media, you in effect have no risk of harm. So therefore, if you are speaking to the media at all, you're seen as you're not a genuine refugee. Um, and it's been very hard to get refugee voices in, in the media here, and I've been working very hard with our clients to, to try and do more of that work. We've had quite a lot of success with the English language media in, in Hong Kong and covering these issues, and I've done some stories with, um, with Joanna. Um, 
less so with the, the Chinese media, and we are working very hard as an organization to, we've recruited a new uh, Chinese speaking um, advocacy officer who will work in these areas. Um, but I have had experiences in, in the past where it has been possible in Hong, and it was a story with um, SEMP actually, with a, a refugee who was um, fleeing Somalia, where we were able to do a really visually impactful piece um, where the identity was uh, was shrouded, but it, it still, it, because we were able to use pictures, it got a really good page lead story. Um, the photographers were very respectful towards the the journal the um, to the uh, subject, the refugee who was willing to talk to the journalists. Um, names where anonymity is very important here, and the journalist we worked with was. I heard a journalist talk earlier, I, th I think I see him in the audience about how he, ne he never gives questions or he never lets, it's you, <laughs> I think. He never gives questions and he never, um, you know, lets people look over a story afterwards. But we worked with a journalist who, because it was so important that the facts were correct, that um, they gave questions in advance, they were able to, um, th myself and the uh, refugee and also the lawyer, were able just to check the facts to make sure that nothing would um, compromise their claim. Um, so it takes a lot of work to support refugees to talk in the media, but I think it's crucial to get their voices in there because they're going to be much more compelling stories that influence public attitudes and policy than, than me talking on someone's behalf. Um, Pauline? To around two minutes. Sure. Um, hi, my name is Holing Yip, and uh, I'm the acting executive director for Hong Kong Unison. Um, some of you might um, know by our organization uh, name, and some of you might recognize uh, um, our previous uh, director, Fermi Wong's name. Um, but anyhow, we're, we're the same. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Hong Kong Unison is uh, an NGO that uh, works with uh, ethnic, ethnic minority issues in Hong Kong. I think, like, ethnic minorities, this term itself encompasses a lot of different people. I think we um, uh, we target ourselves at uh, the residents partially because the, the issues that each groups face are so different. Um, so that's our focus. And a lot of our work focus also on policy advocacy. Um, the issues we deal with uh, ranges from um, access to public services, for example. Um, uh, there was a, a recent piece in the post on bureau services, um, on naturalization and passport, and also on um, civil service, service recruitments, these kind of opportunities. Uh, we also re are really focused on um, the younger generation and education issues in particular, and um, equal opportunities and mobility for ethnic minority residents in Hong Kong. Um, and, and particularly, uh, the recently, education has just received so much of our attention um, because we have been fighting for uh, a Chinese as a second language curriculum or policy in Hong Kong. Um, because right now, uh, or before January, uh, this January, um, all our Chinese curriculum uh, assumes that all students are Chinese language uh, mother tongue speakers. And therefore, we don't have any way to effectively teach students whose mother tongue are not Chinese to learn enough Chinese to have equal opportunities in Hong Kong. So what we end up with is stories and stories of a lost generation of people who were born here and grew up here but ended up not having the kind of tools that they need uh, to become uh, integral parts of this community and to have uh, you know the opportunities that they they should have um, so uh, the the government actually uh, announced a new policy in January um, we have a lot of critiques um, this is not the place to talk about it but we will always <laughs> want to talk about our critiques on that policy um, and Obviously, the media is a very important partner in a lot of our policy advocacy work. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Annie, what has been introduced by Joanna. I came from Indonesia. I flew to Hong Kong in 1999 to be a migrant domestic worker. In fact, I'm still a migrant domestic worker. So um, just give you a brief uh, background why I'm and how actually we deal with the issue of the media. Um, well, the, the, when I came here, I was actually underpaid and no day off, etc. And then so many abuses within the house that made me run away from the employer. I escaped to a shelter that actually gave me education about law in Hong Kong. And that's how I actually know about Hong Kong. 
And uh, since then, I was committed to organizing empowerment, and we formed different organizations among Indonesian. And now we have actually broader alliance of Asian migrants coordinating body, or we call it MCB. This is a alliance of migrant domestic workers coming from Indonesia, Filipino, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. Uh, as domestic worker now, we have more than 300,000. Um, and they are actually tied up within two years contract and there is no hope of even being a permanent resident because, because Hong Kong two years ago has declared the ban on right to apply, not even right to be, but right to apply. So um, bringing the voice, uh, we recognize that the media is uh, very important. We are actually a big community, in fact one the biggest ethnic minorities in terms of number, but the most invisible community by the Hong Kong standard is on the road every day in the house on Sunday but our issue our problem our misery our concerns our social issues not being part of the public discussion in fact there is no in the mainstream so uh, so uh, we recognize that to educate the public the media should be our partner but you know it's not very easy to bring the media into our attention because uh, first and foremost in the eyes of the Hong Kong public our problem is not a problem so it is a problem when we ask for right of a vote, it is a problem. So that's the time the media also will jump in and get a lot of publication. So unless there is very sensual cases, like the recent case, we have one Indonesian who was tortured and abused and body was actually uh, damaged. Uh, and no one is believed this is done by a Hong Kong Chinese female employer who's supposed to be obedient to the law, in fact torture someone like that, which is like only happened in the Middle East then the media will jump in. But if we have to engage into more structural, the one like has been shared by our Unison friends on the structural issue faced by migrant domestic workers, or even ethnic minorities in general, our particularity as us has not been given um, like proper attention. Mm -hmm. yeah. and if I could speak briefly from my journalist point of view, I've been in, I moved to Hong Kong, back to Hong Kong two years ago. And before I came, I studied the media and I was thinking what is underreported and what can I bring that's different? And I found that Hong Kong, knowing it's a very diverse place, I didn't see that diversity res reflected in the media. Um, but as I started here, working as a journalist, trying to pitch stories to my editors, both local and foreign media, about ethnic minorities, I find that um, I would hear that, oh, domestic helpers, living conditions, this has been the case for decades, it's not news. So it was hard to get those stories um, published. And I was interested in refugees and that was even more difficult because in especially local Hong Kong media, to, often if asylum seekers and refugees are in the media, it's for something negative, like they stole a candy bar or something and, and got arrested. A lot of it's focused on crime, the drain they are on society. But what's surprising is that within the last year, two, two things happened that dramatically changed this to the point where I couldn't write enough refugee and domestic helper stories. Um, for refugees, that was Edward Snowden. Um, he came to Hong Kong last May, and there was a lot of speculation about whether he would seek asylum in the city. And I was at a press conference. It was really funny. I'd never seen a press conference held by NGOs on refugee issues so packed to the brim of journalists of, from everywhere. Any foreign media you could think of in Hong Kong was there. And they all wanted to know what would happen to Snowden if he applied for asylum. And the United Nations Refugee Agency representative, she said no, his potential hypothetical claim would not be fast-tracked. He would be in the queue along with every other asylum seeker in Hong Kong. And he may wait for 10 years or more in Hong Kong because Hong Kong doesn't um, accept, even if you, the UN says a refugee is genuine, Hong Kong wouldn't resettle them in Hong Kong. They would have to wait for US or Canada to take their, um, take their case. Um, and people, the journalists also found out that um, asylum seekers, while they're waiting, they cannot work in any way, they can't have any income, and they can't even volunteer, and they must rely on small government handouts and charity. Um, and they were appalled, they're like, this can't happen to Edward Snowden, I mean, he's a white guy from Hawaii, like, that can't happen. Um, so what happened after that was you, you saw a lot of scrutiny of what Annie said, like the structural issues with the refugee policies in Hong Kong, and that became front page news. And since then, I think, I don't know if Aideen can comment on this, but I've seen an improvement in media, local and foreign, being more interested in minority issues as a whole. Um, and the other issue that really changed the landscape for domestic helpers was Ariana's case. 
um, Ariana, the Indonesian 24-year-old helper who left Hong Kong in January covered in scars and bruises. And I was covering that case, and I just saw it really prompted a lot of soul searching in Hong Kong. People saw the images of her injuries. Um, and foreign media, international media were all over that. And I was sent to Indonesia for two weeks to cover that case, to be at her hospital every day. So still, months later, her employer's case trial is still going on. But I've seen a raised level of interest in domestic helper issues and more attempts to do like human interests, um, positive stories as well. So we're here from Chris Buckley from a China correspondent for the New York Times. Um, and he's based in Hong Kong, and but he's been working in China for over a decade. And recently, he's covered a lot of the ethnic polarization in Xinjiang uh, involving Uyghur people and some of the violence that has been happening. If you oh. just introduce your work and some interesting things you've seen. From a distance, I should say, at the moment. Uh, first of all, my apologies for coming late. I'll, I'll explain later why. <laughs> Um, uh, before I, I, I was obliged to move to Hong Kong one and a half years ago, I was based in China for um, the best part of 16 years. So I have a very uh, narrow perspective on the questions of minority reporting, uh, only in so far as they apply to China. So um, I thought what I would do is just put out not so much uh, some observations, but some questions out there that have to do with um, a reporting on minority issues, um, at least in China, and especially how the mainstream media does and should deal with those issues. Um, I, I, I think that the most intense uh, minority stories in China, of course, have to do with uh, uh, Xinjiang and, and the Uyghur population there in Tibet as well. And one of the... Um, abiding questions I have whenever I've gone out to report in Tibet or, 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 or Uyghur areas is the question of how we deal with all of the changes coursing through minority societies in those areas. I think uh, because as some of the panelists are saying, minority issues always come into the mainstream media's focus in a very intense, politicized way whenever there's a crisis, a self-immolation, uh, a political issue, it means that the, those issues come packaged with certain expectations and I fear sometimes stereotypes as well. And I, I per, th this is just my personal view, I should say, I'm not speaking on behalf of the paper. I think one area where the media does tend to fall down is that um, we don't deal so well with the fact that minority societies in China are undergoing dramatic change. Uh, in other words, um, there's this expectation that minority societies are supposed to re remain in some sort of pristine, undisturbed state, and the people acting on their behalf are trying to return them to that state of, without any influence from China, without any commercialization. But all of that has been happening, certainly in Tibet and Xinjiang, and it's having all sorts of profound consequences on you know, even the most remote Tibetan communities, for example, so that if you went to some of these parts 15 years ago, nobody had motorbikes, nobody had mobile phones, nobody had stereo systems, uh, but now they've all become a part of daily life in those areas. And it seems to me that that changes people's expectations of their lives. And if we, if we report on their expectations and views and, and issues, from a perspective that they shouldn't have these things or that they're somehow alien to Tibetan or Uyghur culture, then that's, a, that's putting them in sort of a box of expectations that people might not necessarily want to live in. So it's always seemed to me, certainly in Tibet, I've thought that sometimes reporting on that area hasn't reflected all of the extraordinary changes happening in Tibetan society. Some of them forced, some of them you know, uh, voluntarily taken up by many Tibetans who do want a better standard of material living. So th that, that's one issue. I think the other issue that um, uh, has remained intensely in my mind, certainly since 2009, and reporting on the, um, the, the bloodshed in, in Urumqi in Xinjiang in 2009, is that whenever we're reporting on, on minority issues in minority areas, uh, 
there's not enough focus on, uh, speaking of China, of the long-term ethnic Hun residents in these areas who've acquired their own sense of identity in these areas and their own attachment to these areas and their own political demands as well. And you can, if you're a politician or an advocate, you can criticize those demands. You can criticize the fact that they're there, but they're there. And so whatever happens in these areas is certainly going to be dramatically shaped by this interaction between Tibetan or Uyghur minorities, but also long-standing ethnic Han, ethnic Hui populations in these areas. And it, it seems to me that uh, uh, there could be more reporting on, on that interaction and how it's changing over time mm -hmm. and how it plays out on these issues as well. We can't simply assume that these people are going to go away or that these people have no real claim or attachment to these areas. Mm. So um, have other you. thoughts as well, but I might leave it there. Okay. So before we continue, um, maybe let's go back and define well, what do you think is an ethnic minority? Which kind of people would that term apply to? Is it ethnicity? Does religion make a role? Like, would anyone like to comment on that and how you define the term? Hello? Hi. Um, yeah, um, I think uh, Hong Kong Unison also faced that question a lot of times because um, I think we've been around for a while and we were the first or at least one of the first more prominently focused on uh, ethnic minorities. Um, at least this term, uh, it's, I think it, it, it brings out to question that why did we even use this term ethnic minorities in this panel? I mean, there, were, there are a lot of terms and they, they bring a lot of different connotations, but the connotations also depend on where you are, what background you're from. Um, so I guess at least in the Hong Kong context, this term um, ethnic minority is very associated with um, being disadvantaged, um, economically and politically, and also um, uh, more more associated with South Asians, Southeast Asians um, than, let's say, if you really have to define, you know, minority by numbers. Um, a lot of white Euro Europeans are ethnic minorities, but somehow you don't. It, it's it's a it's a it's a weird term. But I guess at least for us, um, uh, Hong Kong Unison still uses this term partially because. Um, of convenience, um, because there are a lot of common issues that people face, um, uh, not being part of the majority outlook, ethnic and ethnicity, and also with the language. Um, so we actually followed the uh, United Nations term. Um, but I actually do want to th uh, talk a lot about this identity issue, um, especially in reporting um, in ethnic minorities. Um, there's so much of, um, uh, a portrayal of ethnic minorities as the exotic. Uh, the, I'm using this ethnic minorities as in, like, usually they're talking about, you know, South Asians, for example. A lot of the pigeonholing them into uh, the exotic other state. Um, of, I think for me it's a funny story because um, usually before any, every holiday we would get um, calls from reporters. Um, it's almost New Year's. Um, I want to do a report on how ethnic minorities uh, celebrate New Year's. And I'm like, how do, what, how, what does that have to do with their ethnicity? Um, but they're like, uh, you know, um, maybe they don't celebrate it the same way as everyone does. Or like Mother's Day, like how do they celebrate Mother's Day? You know, some of them have more children. I'm like, um, this is a, a it distinctly the, uh, seems to me, I'm, I'm not talking about all reporters, like definitely not all reporters, but it's, it's our experience that um, there, are two, there are two roots. Either they are the exotic other uh, that seem to you know, make this Hong Kong society so colorful because they're so exotic, or, um, oh, it's so interesting that they do the th same thing that we do. And it really perpetuates the whole them and us um, uh, rhetoric and it's it's uh, it's diff uh, it's very concerning to us because uh, one of the issues that Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong Unison has been dealing with is segregation, uh, racial segregation, de facto racial segregation in the the education system, but also I think broadly in the society. And it, what it means is that for a lot of the general public, 
the media is where they get most of the information about minorities, and all they get is that they are the exotic others. Um, so I think that's that's something of our concern to us. Um, and I think relatedly um, is that if we have a more diverse uh, reporter team, I think that would be already one of the the uh, the solutions to this. Um, this is particularly uh, prominent, I think. Sorry, can in I stop you there? Because sure. we're gonna. My solution is going to be my next question. Okay. So, does anyone have any comments on ethnic minority? Whether it's a problematic term, do you use it? Um, yeah. Well, it is a problematic. I mean, um, at when we say about ethnic minorities, actually, it's referring to those non-Chinese who are permanent residents or who are residents. Now, you have a big community of foreign domestic helper who is only seen as FDH or foreign domestic helper. It doesn't even fall under ethnic minorities. It doesn't enjoy the benefit of the ethnic minorities enjoy. So who we are? Now, um, this term is already a problem because we are already excluded actually from the term itself. Now, uh, secondly, um, when it project the issue of you know, domestic workers, for example, of course, we, we do understand that many of our media friends do not understand what we are experiencing. But a lot of the attitude we have is more interrogating instead of understanding. So it's like, really? Do your employer treat you like, so how come you can sleep on the floor for these months? How come you don't complain, blah, 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 instead of like, why you have to stay? Like, instead of like proactive approach, I would rather call it, it's more like putting the victims to be a blame instead of you know extending okay i understand i mean we don't expect media to side but at least to be fair and also knowing when you talk about with ethnic minorities there is particularity of this community that doesn't doesn't exist in general of quote unquote chinese society so i think this is one of still an issue there uh, it will require a lot of education and common dialogues among ourselves Speak about the religious aspect in the Rohingya. Oh. So, I suppose it's yeah. When we talk about religious minor or ethnic minorities and also religious minorities in Myanmar, one of one of the issues that comes up is that people people deny people deny that it's an ethnic problem because they deny that that ethnicity exists. So then it becomes a religious problem but it seems like some Muslims are okay and some Muslims aren't okay. So we can't even really decide if it's an ethnic or a religious problem. We don't, when we're using the word ethnic minor, you know, um, ethnic violence or sectarian violence, none of those terms seem to apply in our reports. We don't know what to put. And then typically we'll say something to the effect of, um, you know, the ethnic, the Muslim Rohingya ethnic minority is, you know, one of the most oppressed in the world, or we, we'll say something to that to that effect, and it it simply never rings true. They are they are an ethnic minority in some parts of the state where they live. They are the majority, <laughs> so then that doesn't really apply there. And there's just there are just so many problems of terminology when we're reporting on this issue that um, you know it just completely complicates the entire process. Mm -hmm. And then, in terms of in terms of trying to decide how to be how to effectively navigate that problem, how to be helpful when we're talking about these minorities, it seems that our re our reporting can frequently ref reflect blind spots that we have or um, prejudices that we harbor. Um, and then also frequently prejudices that the that the local reporters harbor, and it it frequently sort of teaches you something about yourself and what you what you think. Um, the the Rakhine minority, the the Rakhine Buddhists who are frequently wreaking violence on on the Rohingya, are a minority within Myanmar, and themselves are very oppressed and very poor. So frequently, our reporting shows a bias against the Rakhines because we forget that, that they are just a minority, too. And um, pardon my French, but yeah, shit rolls downhill. <laughs> so 
um, the Rakhine themselves have, have had a very difficult time. So uh, Chris, can you talk, um, focusing on local Chinese media and how they portray minorities, and as a foreign correspondent, how do you make sure that your reporting on minorities is um, accurate and balanced when the information out there often has some impact from government perspectives? Well, it, it should be said that, I, I imagine it's true in many areas, but the, 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 the first and most fundamental impediment to doing full and fair reporting on these issues is lack of access. And I, I certainly think in China it's not so much lack of interest in minority issues, and you know, there's any number of reporters who are intensely interested in, certainly in Tibet, in Xinjiang, and also Mongolia as well. But when it comes to access these days, it's become increasingly difficult. Uh, I, I think I, like any number of other reporters, has had the experience of traveling uh, li literally hundreds and thousands of miles to get somewhere and then being caught and thrown out without having had an opportunity to do any reporting of any depth. So uh, that's, that's the first and most fundamental impediment to doing any proper reporting on these issues. Now, the other question you raised is um, mainstream Chinese media reporting on these issues. Well, I think that, you know, again, the problem there is whatever the faults and virtues of that reporting, the fact is it's part of the government's agenda. And what can be reported and what is reported reflects all of the filters that go with that. And that's not to say that all of the reporting is incorrect, but it does come weighed down with all of these biases. And we've certainly seen that in, in, um, you know, in, in reporting on Xinjiang recently as well. Uh, so you know, the, the, does Chinese reporting on minority issues help? Well, it does insofar as it offers a way of uh, a sense of what may be happening and also a sense of what the government's viewpoint might be, but it doesn't give you a very clear sense of what's happening on the ground. So, um, what are some ways you get your information? Like, you've been covering what's going on in Xinjiang and around the country um, from Hong Kong. So, how have you been able to do this? Well, it's extremely constrained from Hong Kong, and you know, I have colleagues who've been able to travel to Xinjiang and in these places. And despite all of the, the restrictions, it is possible to get around. But these days, uh, uh, quite naturally. Uyghurs are increasingly wary of talking to foreign reporters because irrespective of what they say and irrespective of what their views are on the growing violence out there, they can get into serious trouble even for being seen with, with, uh, with, with Western reporters. Uh, so from a distance, there's really only so much you can do and I think that's, uh, that's one of the impediments that reporters in Beijing have at the moment as well. Um, Aideen, because you come from a journalistic background and now you're working with media so closely, could you start the conversation on what journalists can do in s to um, avoid the pitfalls that everyone has mentioned and to do the best work they could? What they could be doing? Or, or what they could be doing to improve and to avoid pitfalls, stereotypes, and what you think the worst stereotypes are? In, in terms of reporting on refugee issues, one of the biggest problems um, or one of the things that, that often gets conflated in the media are these terms, we talked about terms earlier, um, and we see it in Hong Kong um, more often in the, the local Chinese media than the, the English language media. We see conflation of terms around refugees with economic migrants. Um, there's a misunderstanding about um, Hong Kong's status with regards to refugees. We've I've often seen stories in um, the, the local media that talk about um, people who gain refugee status being able to stay in Hong Kong, which is entirely not true. Um, the, the Hong Kong government doesn't uh, is not party to the UN Refugee Convention, and, and even if someone gets refugee status in Hong Kong, um, they can never stay here and they're not recognized by, by the Hong Kong government. So there's a lot of work that agencies like us have to do with the, the local press to, to try and improve that. Um, and I, I think other things that could be done, um, I think in terms of approaching refugees for stories, there has to be 
I talked earlier about the fear refugees feel when talking to the media for numerous reasons, and, and I think reports have to realize that in certain instances, they, they have to maybe approach it in a different way, and, and they have to be more open to giving questions in advance. They have to be more open, open to protect, protecting identities and anonymity. Um, they have to be more open to letting people have a look at the the articles afterwards, if possible. I know that sometimes that's not the case, but it, it, it's so important that things are, are factually correct and reported in a, in a factually correct way because it can really have a life and death impact on, on people. Um, I think, yeah, there are many things we can do. In Scotland, we started many initiatives. We, um, we produced a guide for journalists. Some, some journalists weren't too receptive to it, you know, trying to teach your granny to suck eggs, we would say. But we, we, we produced a guide which was quite receptive. We, um, we started up, a, there's, it's almost refugee, World Refugee Day across the world in, in Hong Kong, and we started up a program called Refugee Week, which actually gave journalists opportunities to report on positive stories about refugees. Um, so it wasn't always the, the same negative stories. Um, and we started a, an initiative called the Refugee Media Awards, which actually um, rewarded positive, um, not positive reporting, but fair and accurate reporting. And, and we, I think as an NGO, um, you talked about Snowden being a, a big turnaround in terms of um, the issues being reported in Hong Kong. I think what coincided with that is NGOs are now much more savvy about dealing with the media and are much more open to dealing with the media. And if you can give the media good stories, they're going to report them. Um, so there has to be more onus on organizations like myself to, to work with refugees. Any other advice for solutions? Um, yeah, thank you. I think um, I personally I do not um, like criticize or even blame our media friends simply because what you see is actually the uh, public view which is set by you, which is actually led by the government. What government say it will be a dominant in the newspaper. Even in our case, when domestic help profile for uh, right of a vote for inclusion in the minimum wage legislation uh, when you know it's suddenly a big news and a lot of uh, misconception misunderstanding on what is the intention behind so things that is be getting scary even to the local people that's made them not supportive to our cause so I think um, if I mean for media friends it is always very good for you to see both sides to a really good report to the community and ask, what do you really want? Why you are asking all these things? And uh, you know, you don't like not to shy to us, but just to be fair and give us space to say what we have to say. I think that that would be a good attitude as a media. And then um, beyond that is also uh, your interaction with us as you know. Um, as community is also important where we can become friends like with Joanna for example we talk a lot about things and this actually help us to beat the you know uh, what what she might not understand what I might not understand just to to help in in both works I think this is um, a good way of uh, moving forward um, I could add a quick point to it I've seen a lot of articles both in English and Chinese local media that's about domestic helpers, but they don't quote one domestic helper. They don't even quote an NGO representing domestic workers. There'd be experts, there'd be employers of domestic helpers, but their voices kind of, are kind of suppressed. Um, it's, it is improving, but I see that myself. Um, I think one of the things that the media could do is really do more balanced and um, I think in-depth or investigative uh, reporting on these issues. Uh, one of the um, I think difficulties that we have is that um, in, in Hong Kong there are very few reporters who follow these issues long enough to gain a newest understanding and to give in-depth reports. Uh, a lot of the things that we do is every time we, we have a new reporter coming to us, we start from the very beginning explaining, you know, ethnic minorities can be local citizens and local residents too. Um, they, can, they don't have to, have to be foreigners. You don't have to ask the question whether they have an ID card. Um, but starting from the beginning we, means that we, there is so little space for us to really hash out these important discussions. And that actually really impacts our advocacy too because I think if the whole understanding that the media portrays is that these people are outsiders, it's very difficult for us to fight for having equal opportunities and rights for them 
as equals of other you know, Chinese citizens. Um, so I think um, uh, investigative uh, reports. Another thing is um, I want to speak on the vulner vulnerability of some of the people that we work with. Um, not to stereotype, there are a lot of very strong uh, ethnic minority women, for example, I'm taking this, but uh, a lot of reporters would be interested in these um, cases that portray ethnic minorities as vulnerable because I think there's, there's some kind of sensationalism that come with it. Uh, but I, it's fine for us. It's, it's a it's an important issue. For example, if we have ethnic minority women who can't speak uh, Chinese or English that are in you know domestic violence, incredibly vulnerable position, and uh, it's a topic that no one really explored. But at the same time, um, it's very hard for us to to convey to reporters sometimes that. Um, these people are real, real people with real lives, and the report will have very real consequences to their lives. And um, and in order to navigate that, you know, what what we should we do? How should we do deal with this report? A lot of times, we we even come to this dilemma of the risk of we either push someone out into the vulnerable open, or we have no case at all. We lose the story altogether. But I think we're, we're forgetting that it's not really just about the case, one or two cases and whether one person is able to stand up or not. It's a lot of the underlying human rights issue and um, you know the, the, the function of the media to perform. I think it, a lot of these issues has to be done in a more in-depth way so that we don't have to rely so much on whether we can give you a good case or not. Um, there's a responsibility for the media organization to train the journalists and for the journalists to come prepared. Um, so we're going to, for the last 10 minutes, we're going to move into the question and answer period. And um, Annie's colleague from the Asian Migrants Coordinating Body, Dolores Valadares, is here. And she'll come up and replace Annie to answer any of your questions. So, so questions? Oh, yeah, Ken. Hi, I'm, I'm Ken Moritsugu. I work with the AP in Tokyo. Um, I had a question about the term um, minority, and you were discussing the definition of ethnic minority, and whether minority is a loaded phrase that should be avoided or not. Um, it seems like when you use the term minority, depending on where you are on the political spectrum, it could mean you could be sympathetic to an oppressed minority, or you could be viewing them as the source of petty crime or something. But in any case, for, for a lot of people, perhaps, and I'm not sure how it works here, but minority may have this, this loaded meaning. So would it be better to just avoid that group, uh, avoid that term, unless you really want to make the point that they're smaller in number than, than the majority kind of thing, and, and just refer to them as an ethnic group, an oppressed ethnic group, or, or something like that? Some thought, actually, we have a lot of thoughts and discussion on this kind of issue. So um, I think first is, um, since this, all terms are loaded and it depends on context. I, I don't know if it's a suggestion whether it depends on you know the audience and where this issue is situated and and to choose the term from the the, uh, the local context or readership context. Um, but I think um, it's also difficult or it's not realistic for anyone outside or reporters or NGOs or whoever to just come up with terms to talk about people. Um, I think uh, why Hong Kong Unionism really struggle with the term ethnic minority is because um, if I see the development of minority issues in other countries, there are a lot more organizations coming out and Minority issues are it's ju it's not one issue. It's incredibly diverse, and there's so many views, and people have different views on their identity. So the re the ideal situation is that there would be a group for every different identity. Then we could have a better public discussion about you know what is the correct term to refer to what kind of people. Um, Right now in Hong Kong, it's incredibly muddled. We're still struggling with how to push forward this discussion, um, partially because um, there are, uh, especially I think, uh, especially in the Chinese media, because um, we at Unison, we were uh, a lot of our colleagues speak and read Chinese, so we're more accessible to the to the Chinese media. So in that area. Um, there aren't too many voices. And when we are just unison one organization talking about it, I have to come up with something a little bit more umbrella term uh, to talk about a specific issue that we're talking about. And then it becomes very muddled. Who are we talking about? Who are we excluding? And what kind of diversity are we hiding by using a general term? 
So I completely agree with you that the term minority is really loaded and then also just isn't always accurate because you can be a minority within a certain geographical area and then not within another. Um, and then also the term minority seems it seems to sort of take pity like, oh, there's, there's just so few of them, they're outnumbered. It's a David and Gol it, it creates a David and Goliath narrative quite quickly. Um, and in some cases, as with the Rohingya, it's, it's accurate and there's fewer of them you know, within a certain geographical area. But I suppose when, when you're trying to avoid certain tropes and you're trying to avoid creating a tired narrative, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not the term to go with. But unfortunately, there don't seem to be very many alternatives that are, so, I mean, I agree, it's horrible, but what am I supposed to say when I'm writing about it? I just don't, I don't know. And, um, and for example, in the, sorry, am I, but in the Burmese media, for example, we're frequently seeing um, sort of, they avoid the term minority and then instead use ethnic slurs <laughs> um, in state media even. So, be, because they're just not sensitive to it. It doesn't, um, and actually the initial violence that happened in near Sitwe was, or one of the catalysts for it was an ethnic slur being used in a headline in state media against the Rohingya. Um, um, Dolores, like I've had this question, I just want to ask you, since you're up here, um, what do domestic workers prefer? Domestic helper, domestic worker, foreign domestic worker, can you let us know which one you prefer? Yeah, uh, of course we prefer to be called as uh, uh, workers, um, because uh, helper is very much different to workers, especially now that there is a recognition on our work as domestic work. Uh, actually, we are celebrating the third year of the um, Domestic Workers Convention, the C-189. And uh, with that definition, domestic workers all over the world are, are recognized. So that could be a proper uh, way how to call domestic uh, workers. Well, it, in, on our end, it feels uh, very derogatory because uh, when you call a maid, uh, a person call a maid, uh, she's belong to a very uh, subclass uh, in the society. Of course, uh, um, at the moment, we also feel that uh, uh, situation. We, we um, experience uh, difficult things while, while working at home. That's why uh, from the very beginning, while, while working here in Hong Kong, we tried to uh, campaign for the promotion of rights, welfare, and the dignity of, of uh, foreign migrant workers here in Hong Kong. And uh, I think uh, this venue, this forum is very important because uh, as uh, migrant workers, we want uh, to have some changes, uh, not only in the condition, but also in the policies of the Hong Kong government. And these changes will happen uh, with the support of uh, the media. We want our issues to be uh, discuss uh, in, in the society and in that sense there will be a public opinion that will create uh, some drastic uh, changes in, in the policies that push uh, the Hong Kong government to, to do uh, corresponding action with regards to our issues and concerns. I was at a government meeting um, getting feedback on domestic helpers policies and actually local politicians brought up numerous times Ariana's abuse case is all over the New York Times. Like, this is horrible. This is putting shame onto Hong Kong. So I do think I've seen that foreign media coverage especially spurs some action in the local government. Um, two more questions. In the back, Sujha. Hi. Um, hello. Hi. I'm um, Sujha from South China Morning Post. I have a question for Chris. Uh, do you see any changes in media? Hello, hello, can you? She's done it in China. D do I need to repeat my question for yeah, Chris? Um, any changes in the portrayal of Xinjiang or Uyghur? 
Iya. Uh, well, where to begin? I, I think um, I think media reporting on on on, on Xinjiang, uh, foreign media reporting on Xinjiang, uh, like everybody else looking at the region, is trying to grapple with the fact that there is growing violence and a pattern of growing violence in, in Xinjiang, and whatever label you choose to confer on it, terrorism, ethnic unrest. Uh, uh, or any other labels, the fact is that we've seen uh, a, a succession of intense uh, convulsions of violence out there, certainly since 2009. And I think against that background, I think um, there is, uh, you know, a, reporters are exploring how to fairly report on that fact and how to register the fact that there is, has been a pattern of growing violence out, out there and how to better understand the causes of that, uh, including from the, the perspective of, of, of Uyghur people out there as well. So is that a changing portrayal? I'm not, I'm not sure whether it amounts to a changing portrayal. I think on the other side, of course, the, you know, the responding to these uh, uh, outbreaks of bloodshed, the government has been of course, intensely pushing its own message that this is part of a concerted campaign of terrorism that is orchestrated from abroad. Now, you know, the, the merits of that interpretation have to be held up and examined, but certainly that's having an effect on, on domestic Chinese coverage of these issues as well. Uh, if I could just add something about this question about do we use the term ethnic minority, I think, well, in some situations, I'm afraid, pragmatically, we will, uh, and uh, you know, in some in some situations, it makes perfect sense. We're talking here about people who are form, if not a distinctive numerical minority, then a disp dispossessed and disadvantaged part of a broader society. And so, is that a minority to me? It makes sense to me that we have some labels that we can use uh, in some situations, all the while being sensitive to not. Uh, stereotyping people or freezing them in some set of expectations about how they're supposed to behave. But uh, I think you can uh, be sure that if you're going to replace the term ethnic minority with another term, it would also become loaded with all of these cliches and stereotypes as well. So it doesn't seem to me the solution to these problems is changing labels. So last question. We're done for today. Okay, and any last remarks from any of you? Well, thank you very much. It seems like we covered everything. <laughs> thank you to panelists. And tomorrow we start at 9, women leaders and journalists. We don't want to miss that. So go to bed early. Thank you.